Good morning. It is very good to see everybody here this morning. We have a lovely spring day today to rejoice in, and it's a great day to worship God together. Glad that you're here. If this is your first time here with us at at College Hill, we're especially glad that you're here, and and we want you to know uh, how how pleased we are to share this moment with you. We hope that we can uh, get to know you a little bit after, after we're through here today. It's good to be together, good to worship together today. People need Jesus, yes? Does Jesus need people? This is a question that I had when I bring myself to Mark chapter 3, which is where we're going to be this morning. When we arrive in Mark chapter 3, we find Jesus so surrounded by people that he can hardly take a step. Verse 7 of that story, Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea, And a great multitude from Galilee followed, and also from Judea, but not just from Judea, from Jerusalem, and not just from Jerusalem, Idumea, and the other side of the Jordan, and from around Tyre and Sidon. Mark could have saved himself some scroll space and just said, everywhere. People are coming from everywhere to see this Jesus. This map is too small because I have to make it small to show you where they're coming from. All the way up here in the north, Tyre and Sidon, somewhere out here over to the east of the Jordan River, some of them coming from way down here in Idumea, and then from Jerusalem and also from Judea. When the great multitude heard all that he was doing, they came to him. Jesus' ministry has gone viral here in Galilee. This is like a Beatles concert in 1964 where it's so crowded you can hardly hear yourself think. It's like seeing Elvis at the airport. That's the sort of picture that Mark is painting here with these crowds who are gathered around him. When the great multitude heard, they come from everywhere. Jesus is quite literally surrounded by people. The first thing we know he does in this passage is he withdrew. And yet everyone from just about everywhere came out of the woodwork and they followed him to the sea. But are these people who follow him followers? You know what I mean when I say followers, right? I mean what Jesus means when he says, if anyone would be my follower, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. I mean what Jesus means when he says, no one who puts their hand to the plow and looks back is fit for my kingdom of God. I mean what Jesus means when he says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Many people follow Jesus to the sea, Are they followers like that? I don't know. It's really not for me to say. But it seems to me that most of the people that are there with Jesus by the sea, most of the people who have been swept up in this Jesus mania in Galilee, most of them want something from Jesus. Is that fair? They're looking for a glimpse of his fame, they're looking for a touch of his cloak. Jesus is not so much followed by this crowd as he is nearly crushed by them. When the great multitude heard, they came to him. And Jesus told his disciples that they should have a small boat ready for them on account of the crowd so that they might not crush him. For he had healed many so that all who had diseases fell upon him that they might touch him. And unclean spirits, when they saw him, were falling before him and and crying out, You are the Son of God. And he rebuked them greatly in order that they might not make him known. Jesus is surrounded by this crowd, and they're nearly crushing him. They're falling upon him. And he shows them compassion. But he also says, get the boat ready. And these people who are surrounding him, it's clear that they need Jesus. But even as Jesus is surrounded by all of these people, You get the sense that he's still quite alone, right? He's surrounded by all of these people. The unclean spirits know him by name, but to all of these other people, he is profoundly popular, and yet 
profoundly, almost crushingly misunderstood. People need Jesus. Does Jesus need people? You know, it's an amazing thing what it can feel like when you're surrounded by people that don't know you. It's an amazing thing when you're away from people who do. Maybe you're away from people who love you or care about you. If you've ever made a $4 a minute long distance phone call, you know what this is like when you're away from people that you love. I remember once when I was in school uh, on a Tuesday in the summertime, 2013, I drove from the city of Searcy, Arkansas to a little town called Biggers, Arkansas, population 334 as of 2016. Anybody been to Biggers, Arkansas? Oh, we got a few that have been to Biggers, Arkansas. Good deal, good deal. If you blink, you might miss it. That's the kind of town that we're talking about here. Uh, somewhere, somewhere, I've got a, a picture of me standing by the, the city sign that says Biggers, Arkansas. There were two things going on in my life that would make me want to drive from Searcy, Arkansas to Biggers, Arkansas to take a picture by the sign. Uh, the first one was that I was dating this cute little redhead girl named Alyssa Biggers. And the second one was that I was at Harding alone. I was uh, taking an intercession Maymester class at Harding during the summer. I needed to take this class or otherwise I wouldn't graduate on time. It was the first two weeks of summer break which means that everybody that I knew, including this cute little redhead girl named Melissa Biggers, were on summer break. And here I was, sitting in William Faulkner's short story class for eight hours a day, and then going home to this empty room on an empty hall and reading William Faulkner's short stories for another five hours of the day. By week two of this class on Tuesday, I had just about lost my mind. My dreams at night were being narrated by William Faulkner. I couldn't get it out of my head. I was so alone. And only under conditions like this would I want to drive nearly two hours just to take a picture at a sign that says Biggers, Arkansas, and drive two hours back because it's amazing what it can feel like when you're away from people you care about, people you love, people who know you. Your whole body, your, your mind, you just feel it. You know what that feels like. I was talking to my granddad recently. Uh, my grandma spent several weeks not too long ago in the hospital. We were talking, and he said, it's just weird when she's not at home. Because they've been together so much and so long, uh, almost 60 years married, they used to be in together. As people, we're meant to be together with other people. I think Genesis gets it right. And it says we were not made to be alone. And that means more than just marriage. As people, we're made to need other people. We need other people to survive. It's how we become who we are. It's how we learn to talk and how we learn to live. It's a part of who we are. And it hurts when that's neglected. And then here we have Jesus. Jesus. The Son of God who chooses for a time to be human like us for our sake. And what a time he has with people. What a time he has with relationships in his life. Just think about what it must be like to be Jesus in our world, walking in our shoes, dealing with the people in his life. Mark chapter 3 has three stories in a row, and they all have to do with Jesus and his relationships in his life. The first one is the one we just saw, verses 7 through 12. Jesus is surrounded by so many people, and they're pressing in at every side of him. They're falling all over him. They're desperate to be with him because every one of them wants him to do something for him, and that's draining. Everybody wants something from him, surrounded by people. Still maybe quite alone. The third story in Mark chapter 3, verses 20 through 35, it begins the same way. Jesus is surrounded by such great crowds, verse 20, that he cannot even take a moment to stop and eat. Imagine that. So many people are gathered around him. He doesn't even have a space to breathe. Only here things are going to go from bad to worse. And we begin to see how truly lonely it must be for Jesus to be Jesus. Verse 21, when his family heard it, they went out to restrain him. They've heard about all this commotion. 
for people were saying he has gone out of his mind. Jesus' own family. They're shaking their heads and they're muttering to themselves and they're telling their neighbors, honestly, we're, we're not sure what's gotten into him. One minute people are going out of their minds to see this Jesus, to touch him, to be near him. Now they're saying he's out of his mind. They're shaking their fingers at him. They're saying, who does he think he is? One minute this Jesus was casting out demons for other people and they were crying out, son of God. Now people are saying this Jesus is a demon himself. The scribes who came from Jerusalem say he has Beelzebul in him. And by the ruler of demons, he casts out demons. Jesus is surrounded by people. But at best, they want something from him. At worst, they want to harm him. And even his family, even his family doesn't stand by him. And then in the middle, between those two stories, we have this. Verse 13. Jesus went up on a mountainside and he called to him those that he wanted and they came to him. I'm just taken by that phrase. Jesus calls to himself those whom he desired, those whom he wanted by his side, and they came to him. And he appointed 12, designating them apostles, that they might be with him. And that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. We're even given their names. These are the names of the twelve that he appointed. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter. James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John, to whom he gave the name Boanerges, which means sons of thunder. Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. In this seemingly simple passage, I think that there is a great challenge for you and me. And a really powerful lesson about our Savior that can change your life if you let it. I don't know if we can really say that the Son of God needs people. As if people could do anything for the Son of God that he can't do for himself. The the reality is God is God with or without us, and we have to remember that. But when the Son of God becomes a person and walks in our world, he chooses to need people, and he wants people who want to be with him. He wants people in his life who want to be with him. That's really the only way I can make sense of this passage. It's really the only way that I can figure out what's going on in this story. Jesus desires a relationship that goes so much deeper than just wanting something from him. Jesus desires a companionship, a togetherness with people who won't just shake their head at him or mutter about him or be ashamed of him or twist his words or make a spectacle. No, in Mark chapter 3, he calls 12 people to his side because he wants them by his side. And as far as I can tell, the one thing these 12 people have in common is they want to be by his side too. They want to be with him and they want to do what he does. And Jesus says, I can work with that. I can work with these 12. That's the only thing I can think of that these guys have in common. You got the four fishermen in this story. You got Peter, Andrew, James, and John. And then we just throw in a tax collector, Matthew, because you know everybody's going to want that. Everybody's going to want to have him join the group, especially these fishermen. You remember we talked two weeks ago about how tax collectors often targeted the fishermen because they had cash on hand. And then if that's not an odd enough pairing already, let's take the person who works for the Roman government and let's put him beside one, maybe two people who want to overthrow the Roman government, like Simon the Zealot, Simon the Revolutionary. Some people also think maybe Judas Iscariot follows along that same path. 
All this to say, at least half of these 12 fellows here have nothing in common with one another. If anything, they are opposed before they meet Jesus. They are opposed to one another. Yet these are the ones that Jesus wants by his side. All they have in common is that they want to be by his side too. Even if it doesn't gain them anything, like the crowds in the first story, even if it means that they're muttering and and scandalized and talking about slandering them too, like the crowds in the third story, these 12 are different than the rest. They're different than even Jesus' own family because they want to be with Jesus on Jesus' terms. So Jesus gives them a high but simple calling, and this is my challenge for you too. This is Jesus' calling to his closest companions. He calls them that they might be with him first and foremost. And that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. In other words, to do the very things that he has been doing in the Gospel of Mark. The calling is simple. Be with him. Be like him. This is what these 12 are called to do and called to be. It's not so different, I think, for you and me today. And this is the part that will really change our lives if we'll let it. When you think about who Jesus is to you in your life, where do you fit in the story of Mark chapter 3? People need Jesus. Everybody needs Jesus. But what does your life say about who Jesus is to you? Are you like the crowds in the first story? You want Jesus because you want something. You need something from him. And so you press and you press and you follow him to the shore because he can do something for you. Now, of course, Jesus can do something for us that nobody else can do, and we're right to want that, that healing and that grace and that forgiveness that Jesus alone can provide. In Mark 3, Jesus has compassion on those people who are falling upon him, but he also calls to him those whom he wanted, and they wanted more than just to fall upon him. They wanted to follow him. Who is Jesus to you? Are you like the crowds in the third story? Wishing maybe you could hold Jesus back just a little bit. Maybe just dial him down just a little bit. I mean, after all, what would the neighbors think? These crowds pressed in on Jesus at every side. But they wanted a Jesus they could control. A Jesus who could be more like what they wanted him to be. Who is Jesus to you? Or are you like the twelve? In story number two, the 12 that Jesus wanted by his side, are you willing to follow Jesus for more than what he can do for you? Are you willing to follow a Jesus who is beyond your control, who cannot be restrained or held back? Would you choose to follow Jesus because you want to be with him? And you want to be like him. Who is Jesus to you? It's not so much about where you're coming from. The end of Mark 3 makes this pretty painfully clear, actually. As Mark chapter 3 comes to a close, Jesus' mother and his brothers are out there and they're looking for Jesus. And they come to a place where a crowd is sitting around Jesus. Notice they're not crushing him. They're not restraining him. They're sitting around him and listening. And the crowd sees this family coming, Jesus' own family, and they say to Jesus, your family is here. They're asking for you. What does Jesus say? Who is my family? Whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. It's not about where you've come from. It's about having a heart that says, I want to be with you. 
I want to be like you in my life. I'm going to offer an invitation this morning, and I hope that we are challenged today to have that sort of desire in us, that sort of heart in us that says, I want to be with Jesus in my life. I want to have the sort of relationship with him that goes beyond just what I can get or what I can control. I want to be like Jesus. I want my life to look more like his. I want to do the things that he is doing in the world. Maybe there's someone here today, and and what you need to hear is that no matter where your starting point may be, if you're one who wants to be with Jesus, and you're one who wants to be like Jesus, Jesus says, come on, I can work with that. Just like these 12 that he calls to his side. Maybe today you're ready to to follow him like never before. To say with your life, I want to be with Jesus. I want to be like him. To give your life in baptism in his name. However you may be called today, we offer this moment to reflect and to respond. While together we stand and while we sing.